It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. These are the final seconds. The lead in the fourth. Can they hold on to it? That do or die time. And everything rides on one shot. But it isn't going to be that easy. This is down to the wire. One shot to take you to the top. One win. This is clutch basketball. That's the NBA playoffs. That's game. You are Locked On Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns, and I'm your host, Brendan Clean. I cover the Suns in the NBA at SB Nation, as well as Dime Magazine. You can follow me on Twitter, at BrendanClean14. You can follow our show on Twitter as well, at Locked On PHX Suns. Welcome back, as I said, day after Game 3 of the NBA Finals. I hope that nobody had taken the loss too, too hard. I'm here to, hopefully, shed some light on more of what to expect in Game 4, what really went wrong in Game 3, and what honestly, could just be different organically in Game 4. Because I do think in some ways, the more that I went back and looked, Game 3 was an outlier in a few ways. We're going to talk about how the Suns can contain Giannis, because I don't think just saying uh, screw it is necessarily the best plan. I think there are some things, as I went back and looked, that they can do. We'll talk about the big discrepancy in ball movement. The Bucks suddenly looking as if they are the better ball movement team. We know that's not true, and how the Suns can get that margin closer or potentially even look uh, to overtake how the Bucks are moving the ball. And then uh, we're also going to talk about how the Suns' offense in and of itself just gave some easy things away to the Bucks By just playing smarter offense, I think this series could look a lot closer. So we'll get into all of those things um, in just a second. First, though, today's show is brought to you by Michelob Ultra at only 2.6 carbs and 95 calories. It's only worth it if you enjoy it. Stay tuned later in the show for the Ultra Player of the Week. So let's start here with the Giannis Antetokounmpo matchup, how the Suns can contain him and why Game 3 in some ways was the norm, but also doesn't have to be. So Here's my first thing. They just need to cut out the easy stuff against Giannis. Really. Um, I went back and, you know, you just look at the box score. And some of these things are pretty... I don't I don't want to say easy, because the guy is a beast. He's a two-time MVP. And it, it can sound almost reductive when you talk about limiting a player like that. But four offensive rebounds? The Suns just, you know, they had one of their worst rebounding games of the playoffs. I think that's pretty fair to say in Game 3. They were not boxing out. They were not even in position. Giannis being on the move more, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. The ways that this, that the Bucks' offense was functioning, I think the Suns just didn't feel comfortable. Their, their normal sort of setup of where bodies are to gain rebound, to box out. Plus, with Aiton not defending Giannis quite as much as we had seen in the past, Crowder was on him, and that meant that Aiton was often defending Brook Lopez, and that means that Aiton's not going to be around the rim because Rook Lopez was not a big part of the offense, and so Aiton being out there, the guarding Brook on the in the corner, spacing the floor, whatever it was, or you know, in transition, the Bucks were able to get a lot of offensive rebounds. All of these things meant that Aiton was not where he needed to be, not by his fault, I don't think, but just by the way that this that the game sort of broke down. So That's a pretty easy fix. If Giannis gets one offensive rebound or maybe two, that game looks different. I mean, Giannis goes from 42 to maybe 38 points. This is how I like to look at these things, and I think you guys know that by now because you just, the margins are so tiny. And I think to me, that was the big takeaway from this game is the 20 point deficit is is a lie to me. And the Suns can clean these things up just by chipping away at little parts of it. So, That's one thing. Cutting the easy stuff, offensive rebounds, DeAndre Ayton being closer to the rim, the Suns looking to get those gang rebounds if Ayton's not around. That's just a focus thing, a mentality thing, a film thing. The other thing is, to me, that the tempo in in a lot of ways benefited what Milwaukee likes to do. They got 16 fast break points. They also scored 17 points off of Suns turnovers. So 
that right there, some of those are going to overlap. That's not 33. Some of those points off turnovers obviously come on the fast break. But look, that's almost, you know, 15 to 20 points just right there. And that right there could be your deficit if you want to look at it that way, right? So Giannis was a big driver of those those fast break points, of those pace buckets and he was aggressive not only I thought as a playmaker uh, or I'm sorry as a scorer but as a playmaker and in the past it was in the first two games Giannis getting to the bucket in transition which we all know he can do it's one of the reasons he's such a special player in this game he was really looking to set up teammates which is you know head ahead passes everything else so you combine his quickness and his awareness on the fast break with you know getting the ball down the floor even faster because it's not just him dribbling it's you know getting the ball to guys already up the floor and I think that was something the Suns were not ready for so Drew Holiday got an early three I think the first bucket of the game was a holiday uh, corner three they were cutting in transition they were just smarter in transition than they had been and the Suns did not seem up to that so that not to say again that it's easy but I do think an awareness film study and focus and matchup thing can be really all that needs to happen there. That's not a fundamental breakdown that the Suns are incapable of fixing, right? But the other thing to me, so cutting out the easy stuff, that's rebounding and pace and and just transition defense. The other one to me, though, maybe a little bit more concerning or going to take some more doing to fix is the matchup. So I just think first off the bat, the Frank Kaminsky minutes, I just don't think that they're worth trying anymore. Um, the Dario Saric injury was a killer. It sucks. It's disappointing for him as a person. It's disappointing for this son's rotation. It makes things hard for Monty. I just think I get the Frank idea. I even brought up to Jackson Frank, which is coincident, um, on the preview show. For those of you who listen to that, you'll remember I was trying to advocate for Frank Kaminsky to play in, in this series. I was wrong. I was dumb. And him being big is not enough. It's, it's, uh, it's a complete death sentence for the lineup that he happens to be in. And he has lineups that he might work in. He has opponents. He has moments in the season. Mostly a regular season player. Those minutes just need to be gone. Cam or Torrey Craig need to be just getting the bench big man minutes. Maybe you work it so you have Crowder in there with them. So you just have as much size as possible. Maybe Bridges. Maybe all four. Who knows? But that's what I would do. And I think that's what we will see Monty do. The other thing we saw in game three was that Crowder defended Giannis a lot early on. And I really... I don't have a great answer for why that would be. Um, Aiton had not struggled with foul trouble. He had had good games. Maybe it was something to do with Aiton not having a great game offensively in game two, and maybe they wanted Aiton to start on Lopez so that he could be more involved offensively. That worked, so I do think that was a success if that was the goal. But what it ended up meaning is that Giannis just did not have anything getting in his way to start the game. He got into rhythm in an instant, and I think Crowder can work on Giannis. We saw him. He's really good at pulling out the chair in the post. He has these little tricks that Giannis doesn't quite know what to do with, but as a general principle, he doesn't have the strength to defend Giannis, and he was the one that fouled Giannis a couple of times, and just it doesn't. it's just obvious that it doesn't work as well. So I think you need to start DeAndre Ayton on Giannis, I get that, you know, there's there's some parts of that that aren't great. We talked about the defense. He's going to have to exert more energy there. But if you just want the matchups to be the best thing for stopping Giannis Antetokounmpo and the Bucks' offense, I think you just have to have DeAndre on him almost 100% of the time. Crowder maybe as a change of pace option, but no more than that. And within that, the last thing I wanted to hit on, when it comes to matchups, a lot of you guys are probably thinking as I'm saying all of that, well, you don't want Aiton to have the foul trouble, right? That's why you might not want him on Giannis. But of DeAndre Ayton's five fouls, only one was a shooting foul on on Giannis Antetokounmpo. Only one. And so it's just not really a concern. Ayton doesn't foul him on the ball when he is guarding Giannis. He just doesn't really do that. He didn't do it in games one or two. The fouls he did have in game three were not really as a result of that. So he had a, a shooting foul on Middleton. He had a shooting foul on Lopez. He also had a loose ball foul, and then I guess that would be all five. Uh, No, that's four. I think the other one was an off-ball foul away from the ball. It was just labeled as a personal foul in the play-by-play. So you can live with Aiton being on Giannis basically full-time. I get the Crowder idea. I understand there's some units where you like that. I think it can work for a minute or two at a time, a possession or two at a time. I think it's smart to not always give Giannis the same look. 
But overall, no more Frank Kaminsky. Go small with that second unit. Have Aiton on Giannis as much as you possibly can. And then cut out that easy stuff. And Giannis will have a quieter game. Is he going to score 32 to 40? Maybe, but what if it's less efficient? What if he is not getting guys involved as well as a passer? What if he is, you know, having to really work in the half court? All of that stuff is going to give you a better chance to win, and I think we'll see it as soon as game four. All right, that'll close us off for the honest stuff. Next, we'll talk about how ball movement told the story of game three and how the Suns can improve there. First, though, folks, a quick word from Michelob Ultra, who sponsors this week's Player of the Week, which is DeAndre Ayton. I have to give it to him because on the one hand, you know, you could look at the idea that he had this foul trouble in game three. He didn't have the great scoring in game two. But first of all, I think he's been pretty darn good in every single game. He just has had these blips that look every player has because it's the NBA finals. Giannis was not his best in game one. Drew Holiday's had a pretty bad series. Everybody is exposed in these playoffs. Everybody is exposed in the finals. And DeAndre Ayton has found a way. But most importantly, the reason he's getting this is because of his response to Monty Williams' pep talk there in Game 2. DeAndre Ayton is externally motivated. I've written about this. I've talked about it. He finds joy. He finds happiness from basketball by other people, whether that's the players he's matching up with or his teammates or his coaching staff. That's where he gets it. Enjoyment is not the end game. It's the whole game, is what Michelob Ultra loves to remind us of. And DeAndre Ayton is the epitome of that. Only 2.6 carbs and 95 calories, folks. Michelob Ultra sponsoring our Ultra Player of the Week, DeAndre Ayton, who is consistent and incredible at a young age in the NBA Finals, finding that joy in making his teammates better and getting this Suns team over the hump. Today's show also brought to you by Theragun. Don't let the stress of daily life weigh on your body. Whether you're an elite athlete or someone like me, just trying to make it through the day, tension-free Theragun can help. Theragun is the handheld percussive therapy device that releases your deepest muscle tension using a scientifically calibrated combo of depth, speed, and power, all in something as quiet as an electric toothbrush. That's right, the Gen 4 Theragun doesn't just feel good, it gets to the source of the pain by releasing tension quietly using Theragun's signature percussive therapy, which goes 60% deeper than vibration alone. Whether you want to treat your muscle tension from working out, an injury, or just the stresses of everyday life, there's no substitute for the Theragun Gen 4. The OLED screen and design make you feel like you're holding something from the future. You can go to their site to check that out. And the Theragun app learns from your behaviors and suggests guided routines based on what you've done in the past. Theragun is trusted by 250 professional sports teams like Real Madrid, as well as elite athletes like DeAndre Hopkins, Arizona's own Cardinals wide receiver, as well as hundreds of thousands of customers all across the world. Try Theragun for 30 days starting at only $129. Sorry, $199. That's $199. Go to theragun.com slash locked on right now and get your Gen 4 Theragun today. That's theragun.com slash locked on, theragun.com slash locked on. Let's dive right back in, folks, talking about how the Suns' ball movement has faltered right at the same time that Milwaukee's has picked up and how that can get a little bit better. Um, it's 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 the story of game three, in my opinion. So I'll give you some numbers. I'll give you some reasons why we saw that happen. And maybe, hopefully, I can try to crack how it could get better. Today on our road to the finals coverage, though, it is brought to you by Michelob Ultra. The Suns are close. Michelob Ultra has been with us all the way. Only 2.6 carbs and 95 calories. It's only worth it if you enjoy it. And we can all enjoy the games a little bit more this season. Okay, stats. Let's get let's get to the, the nitty-gritty on the numbers just so you guys can get what is actually happening here in terms of why the ball movement does tell the story of Game 3. Bucks had 28 assists, Suns had 21, but you know that already. Within that, though, NBA.com has deeper stats of how the ball movement really played out. So the Bucks had 28 assists, but they had 47 potential assists, and they had 73 points created off assists. To me, you know, that obviously shows they missed some shots that they could have assisted, but also their 73, that's a really high number. That means that a lot of their threes were assisted and they made a lot of them. Obviously, we know they out they outshot the Suns. So they were moving the ball better than they normally do, better than the Suns did, because here's what the Suns had in those same stats. So those 21 assists, like, you know, but within that 41 potential assists, which is six fewer than the Bucks had, and only 53 created points created off of assists. So that's 20 points fewer than the Bucks. 
So that really puts into perspective just how much worse the Suns were able to move the ball than the Bucks and actually have those passes be functional, right? Because look, the other stat I'm going to have for you right here says something a little bit different, but it's obvious that Milwaukee had more purpose with what their ball movement was going to be, which we'll break down with the X's and O's standpoint in a second, but the Suns made 279 passes. This is the last stat. 279 passes from the Suns. That's down from 284 per game in the regular season. On the other side, the Bucks 264 passes made, which goes even further to show you they passed the ball less than the Suns and still created all of that stuff off of assists. So they were much more purposeful, but that's actually up from 254 in the regular season. So they're moving the ball in game three better than they did in the regular season, creating a ton of points off of it. The Suns moving the ball less than they did in the regular season and not doing a very good job of turning those passes into actual offense. Bad, right? It's bad. That's the that's the main thing you need to take away. It's not good. Um, and it's also uncharacteristic, right? So right off the bat, you can obviously see that the Suns, if they just do it a little bit closer to what they did in the regular season, get guys going to the basket. DeAndre playing more would be a massive part of that, but obviously also Mikhail Bridges, who did not really have much of a game on offense at all. If he can cut more, if Booker can get off the bound, or I'm sorry, off the catch threes as opposed to all the pull-ups he was taking, we know all these little things the Suns do to get offense off of passing. They do it, it's, it's who they are. It just didn't happen in game three. I think that it can. If there's anything to worry about as part of this ball movement discrepancy though, it's how the Bucks were getting all of that offense off of passes. And that's where I think you have to be at least a little bit worried. So we saw way more Giannis Holiday pick and roll and Giannis Middleton pick and roll than we had in games one or two. And you guys who have been listening know that that's something I had been wondering why we hadn't seen. And I guess, you know, as a the homer in me probably hoping we didn't see it, right? But it, it was bound to happen because it was such an obvious thing. The Suns were getting so comfortable just putting Aiton onto Crowder or I'm sorry, onto Giannis and Crowder onto Giannis when they wanted to and just resting with that because Giannis was ISOing a lot and everything else and it was just comfortable for the Suns defensively and I think that's why you saw the Bucks not be able to score too much. The Suns can stop Giannis if he just ISOs on DeAndre Ayton. We saw that. We know that. What he can't do is... What, what the Suns can't do is guard Giannis when he's on the move. I talked about how he got to the basket cutting a lot more. I think in general, um, the other guys were able to get involved. And it's the biggest concern because it allows the matchups to not be so comfortable. They're now We saw this starting at the beginning of Game 3, and they're now really picking at it, which is Giannis getting a screen and then being able to be guarded by the player he wants to be guarded by. In this case... For the most part, he was going after guys like Kaminsky, obviously, but even Mikhail Bridges. So that's the number one thing. And I think if there's anybody you trust to have a better game defensively against those guys, in uh, and Giannis in particular, in game four, it has to be Bridges. He just has to be more ready to guard Giannis when those mater- matchups materialize. Giannis right now in the series so far is four of four from the field for 1.6 points per possession when he's been guarded by Mikhail Bridges. It's just not good enough. And so... Kaminsky not playing, Bridges being more ready. He doesn't have the strength to do it full-time. It's going to be a chore for him. But I think just generally speaking, if he just knows that that's going to happen, knows that that's coming, even if he gives up a few fouls, I don't think that's the worst thing ever. But he's just getting bowled by over and over when Giannis has him, and that can't happen. The other last part of it, and we're talking about Giannis not only as a scorer but as a playmaker, and he was able to do that because he's getting downhill off of these Drew and Middleton pick-and-rolls or he's able to, you know, be the roller, he's able to be a cutter, or he just is able to, you know, get the switch that he wants and, 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 and attack. But he's also playmaking within that because the defense is having to help once they see that bad matchup or see him in motion. And that's where we saw the role players really have better games. Connaughton had a pretty good game in game two, but he was even better in game three. He had an assist to Giannis. He had a cut for a bucket. He had a couple of threes off of Giannis passes. That two-man game was really working. Bobby Portis also, I think it's a big reason why he was able to have a big game. His offensive rebounding was pretty big um, for the Bucs. He had four 
I think that was because of the attention devoted to Giannis. And, you know, an energy player is going to thrive when the defense doesn't get to key in on him. So Portis, I think, just was able to kind of take advantage of the fact that the Suns were so keyed in to stopping Giannis Antetokounmpo. So I think that's here to stay. They pick and rolls with their superstars. It's an obvious thing. They should have been doing it from the jump. However, I think the Suns can move the ball better. I think if they don't turn the ball over, which we're about to get to in just a second when I talk about the Suns' offense overall— they, the Bucks just won't be able to get into as much of a rhythm. I think you'll see those assists come down. I think you'll see those open threes that they created come down. And I think you'll just see a team that is more ready to um, handle it on the Sun side. So let's talk about the offense, though, in just a second, how they can solve a lot of what happened to them in game two, just or in game three, just by keeping up with the Bucks on offense. So we'll get into that in just a second. First, though, folks, a quick word from Rock Auto. Rock Auto is here to save the day for the pain in the butt process that is shopping for car parts. It's pretty much impossible these days with how many makes and models there are to just walk into your local chain auto parts store to get what you need. So why endure the often pointless and intimidating questioning that you'll get at a place like that when you could just log into Rock Auto? Rock Auto is a family business. They've been doing this for over 20 years. You do not even need an account to log in, let alone a subscription. It's reliably low priced. That's the main thing that Rock Auto is here to give you. So don't choose to spend 30%, 50%, even 100% more on the same exact parts from a dealership when you could go to rockauto.com. So do it. That's all you got to know. Just go ahead and do it. They're going to have something that you need for your car or truck. So go to rockauto.com, check out what's available for your car or truck by typing in that model, hitting go, and then scrolling down to the part. It's that easy, that simple. And when you make your purchase right, locked on in there, how did you hear about us box so they know we sent you? Amazing selection, reliably low prices, and all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. These are the final seconds. The lead in the fourth. Can they hold on to it? That do or die time. And everything rides on one shot. But it isn't going to be that easy. This is down to the wire. One shot to take you to the top. One win. This is clutch basketball. That's the NBA playoffs. That's game. Let's close out the show with more on the Suns offense before I get you out of here. I think... Just playing smarter, getting back to the basics, creating efficient shots on offense. These are things we know the Suns are great at when they're at their best, and they do tend to bounce back big time on offense, I think, after a down game. You think about games three and four in in Los Angeles. They won game four, but they scored a combined 176 points or something like that, if I'm remembering right. They had an 84-point game and a 92-point game in LA in the last round, and then they come back in games five and six. Offense looks a lot better, especially in game six, right? So, <clears throat> we know this is possible. We know they can do it. And sometimes the numbers just tell the truth when it comes to this stuff. So the Suns took just 16 shots at the rim in game three. 16. I don't know how much of you guys are looking at that number day to day, but that is ridiculously low. Think about how many shots they took in total. Only 16 of them came at the rim. The Bucks, on the other hand, took 28. That's a huge difference. Suns, 40 points in the paint. Bucks 54 points in the paint. And then, of course, what I said just before the break, the Suns had 14 turnovers, which is not typical for them, and the Bucks only had nine. So just getting those numbers either even or back in the Suns' favor could go a really, really long way. The Suns are an efficient team. They take care of the ball. They get good offense. They get efficient shots when they are at their best. You'd expect some of that to just naturally happen. I don't necessarily feel like the Bucks did anything super impossible to penetrate in game three defensively. I think that the Suns just did not play as smart. And then the other thing that happened is that Devin Booker was so far from himself. And I talked last night with Brandon Duenas about, you know, was it an injury? Is he hurt? Is it soreness? Is it something? He did only play 29 minutes. You'd expect him to be better in game four, but he just was not himself in terms of the types of shots he was taking, the aggressiveness that he usually has. Only two of his 14 shots were in the paint. He missed both of those. He was obviously three of 14 overall from the field. He was two of three from mid-range. So he only made one three and then those two mid-range shots. And that was his entire bag in terms of made shots. So that's not the Devin Booker we know. Him being more aggressive, getting he also only took five free throws. Only got to the line five times. So if he's more aggressive, if he's driving, if he's getting comfortable, 
early. I think you could see Booker always has big first quarters when he's locked in. I think he will be that in game four. That would be humongous because we saw the Bucks just control the game from the jump and Booker scoring better would have changed that. Other reasons to be optimistic about Devin Booker here. I went back and looked at the matchups on this as well. I talked to you about the Giannis Bridges thing. On the other side though, I think Booker is not really phased by Tucker or Middleton. He's 11 of 21 combined, even after that ugly game last night when he's guarded by Tucker or Middleton. 11 of 21, that's better than 50%. This is just an outlier bad game from Devin Booker. Unless there's some mysterious thing going on with him that we just do not know, which I do not believe is the case, then the Suns can win games if he plays a little bit better. They also can win if he's better, but still not great. We don't need Devin Booker to score 50 for the Suns to win, right? That's not even what it's been. They won with him going 10 of 26 in big games. They've won with him being pretty ineffective as a scorer and getting it done when when they need him to by passing, shooting, etc. So that's been the recipe. They don't need him to be awesome. They just need him to be better. Overall, I think Giannis is going to be a beast. I think they figured some things out on both ends. Milwaukee has, but the Suns can still win games by getting their usual out of Devin Booker, not giving Milwaukee those easy points, and just not making dumb mistakes. It's frankly what happened in game three. It will not happen in game four. We know these Suns bounce back. We know that they play efficient offense. They would not be here if they didn't. So it's it's not as ugly as it, as it can be. I think if you're walking away from this show, the, the pick and roll with Giannis and Drew and Giannis and Middleton is probably the thing to be most focused on, but we'll have another show for you, getting you ready on Wednesday morning for game four, so you don't have to be too nervous yet. I'll have more for you coming up, hopefully with more of what these folks have said in the media, get you uh, the latest on all of that. But in the meantime, enjoy your Tuesday. Do not feel too down, and I will be back tomorrow. Giannis doesn't let Milwaukee go gently into that good night. Here's what our local experts are locked on today. The Milwaukee Bucks blow out the Phoenix Suns in Game 3 of the NBA Finals on the back of a second consecutive 40-10 performance from Giannis Antetokounmpo. Final score 120 to 100. Today on Locked on Bucks, our local expert Kane Pittman discusses the growing legend of Giannis, Drew Holiday's X-Factor performance, and Devin Booker's struggles. A lot of baseball to pay attention to. The MLB draft began on Sunday. Monday night, the MLB's All-Star ceremonies begin with the Home Run Derby. Get up to speed on everything by subscribing to the Locked on MLB podcast today. Back to the NBA Finals. Should the Phoenix Suns be worried? The answer is on the Locked On Today podcast. All the sports news you need in under 20 minutes. Follow Locked On Today, today, wherever you get podcasts. Local experts on the biggest stories. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.